Welcome to this uh, live case webinar organized by uh, GE. I'm Stéphane Long from Paris. It is my pleasure uh, to moderate this session with uh, Rachel Clough uh, from London. We have experts uh, from uh, both sides of the Atlantic that are going to share their experience with the latest uh, hybrid room uh, Alia from GE. And um, I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, Omid Stewart and Gustavo. Omid, can you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, Omid Jazeri from uh, Denver, Colorado. I'm going to be talking a little bit to everyone today about the, um, the new hybrid uh, system pro uh, provided by GE, the ALEA system, and we're going to be looking at a case of uh, aortic dissection. Thank you, Omid. Stuart? Hi, I'm Stuart Walsh. I'm from Galway in Ireland, um, and we're going to be talking about a case of a lower limb revascularization that we did with our new ALEA system, which just arrived a few weeks ago. Thank you, Stuart. Gustavo? Hi, my name is Gustavo Odrich. I'm in Houston, Texas. I'll be sharing with you a case of a thoracoabdominal aneurysm that we perform in the G. Alia room. Thank you very much for those nice introductions. And I'd like to remind the audience to submit their questions online as we go. And now, Omid, I'd like you to begin, please, by presenting your case of thoracic aortic dissection. Thank, thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you very much. If we can have our slides, please. So this is a 58-year-old uh, Caucasian male who presented with uh, accelerated hypertension and was ultimately diagnosed with a type 3A aortic dissection. As you can see, the medical history is pretty standard, COPD hypertension, no real surgical history to, um, to speak of. He, d he does smoke and, and his father did die of a ruptured uh, aortic aneurysm. Um, as you can see, this is a, a type 3 aortic dissection, starting at the uh, subclavian, extending down to the celiac. And this was his CTA on admission. He was medically managed, as we often do, and he had a short follow-up scan in three weeks, which unfortunately demonstrated propagation from a 3A to a 3B aortic dissection. Um, and, and at that point, we, we recommended a repair of his uh, aortic dissection. In doing so, we, we planned a percutaneous right radial access. The patient was dissected into his right, in, uh, right iliac system, and we chose to ignore that um, and avoid that and come from the right arm. Intravascular ultrasound is key. Um, we planned a percutaneous thoracic aortic repair with the Cook dissection scent, which allows us to have a short coverage and, and then extend the flap down with a bare metal stent. And most of this was uh, available and, and done through the preoperative scanning with the GE Advantage workstation. And we're going to go right into that. So if we can have the, the video, please, of Omid. Just while that's loading, can I invite you all at, at home to keep on submitting your questions? Perfect. And, and as you can see here, this is uh, some of the preoperative planning that's taking place um, uh, in, in the control room. As you can see, what we're doing over there is putting a uh, line, actually moving the center line and placing it right into the true lumen so that we can follow that um, from the left iliac up. And as you can see, we, we've have some volume rendered images of both the true lumen, as you can see in blue, and then the false lumen, which will be in red, um, and, and as well as the branched vessels there. Um, if you can see on the right side of the screen there, you can see how the true and the false lumens are, are outlined, as well as our branches, in order for us to be able to plan this. This is our hybrid room. It's about two months old, and uh, as you can see, it's, um, it's, this is us doing an orthogonal view to register the patient. One of the nice things about the ALEA system is uh, that you don't always have to do a CAT scan to be able to register the patient. You can swing from two 90 degree angles and be able to register the images just off of those. And that's exactly what we're doing here. At the bedside, you have the ability to translate. And here, we, we, the bones were the most obvious uh, landmarks for us to be able to translate our images here. 
and you can see the machine is still at an angle as, as we're making our adjustments at the bedside. No need to unscrub or go to the control room to do any of this stuff. You can do it right from the bedside, as you can see. And, and it's a touch screen, which makes it really helpful. Um, and if you're wondering if that plastic cover makes any difference, it really doesn't. Um, the system is sensitive enough that you don't have to worry about that and, and make any extra adjustments. Um, we're a big proponent of intravascular ultrasound, so we, we want to make sure that that wire ends up in the true lumen. And initially, and, and that isn't shown in the video, but initially our wire was in the false lumen and we had to reintroduce, and instead of using a catheter, we just navigated the whole aorta using the intravascular ultrasound. And Go. Maybe I can ask you a question at that stage, I mean, because um, we were using IVUS uh, at, before having access to uh, Alia, uh, but since we've uh, used those uh, fusion masks you showed, true lumen, false lumen, does it is it still mandatory to go through that IVIS uh, it, it, step? It's, it's not mandatory. Um, I was doing it be, just to be safe, as, as this was one of our first cases. I suspect that as our learning curve gets better, that we will just use the volume rendered images that we had in the beginning to navigate the, the true and, and the false lumen. And you can see here, we're in the true lumen. That wire actually made it into the subclavian. So I'm, I'm pretty happy about that as, as we're crossing. We do use transesophageal echo a lot, um, A, for wire placement, and B, just to make sure that we're not damaging the uh, ascending aorta or causing a retrograde dissection. But, but using the, the catheter and, and the advanced imaging, and, and you'll see we're going to superimpose this here. Um, the registrations aren't always perfect, and I think this uh, speaks to the dynamic nature of the ascending aorta and the arch. But as you can see, these, these images are real easy to be able to register. And again, we're, we're swinging back and forth at, at these 90 degree angles to be able to uh, accurately align our um, images with our plan for the surgical procedure. The green line that you see is, a, is the wire in the true lumen. Um, you can see how our wire follows the green line and then the IVUS is there mostly for backup again, just to, as, again, as we're doing these early cases, we wanna make sure that we're safe with the patient, but, but the registration, once it's done, is, is very accurate. Um, at least it's been my experience. And you can see at the top uh, left, the IVUS is right where the, uh, the blue circle outlining the origin of the dissection and the zone four where the, <coughs> the dissection starts. Um, again, just doing some more confirming and translating, mostly uh, our own learning curve here, and, and making sure that we're taking advantage of all the uh, bells and whistles that the ALEA system does have. Um, our imaging catheter is from the right arm, as you can see. Um, and, and the registration, again, can be affected by the stiffness of your wire. But at this point, we're mo mainly interested in the origin of the left subclavian. Um, you can see us uh, delivering the first device, um, and and keep your keep your eyes on on uh, the device as it makes it through and and at at our large blue circle, which was again done preoperatively on the Advantage workstation, and the device is really navigates the aorta nicely, you kind of deploy it and bring it back, and I'm sure a lot of our audience does have experience in doing this. Um, and we do take a second just to make sure everything is lined up. And you know you did it right, because that's our rep, and he is actually not putting a mark on the screen, <laughs> because we're, we're pretty um, dead on on the subclavian. So you, you know you did it right when your rep isn't putting marks on your screen. Um, and as you can see, the device is deploying, and we will follow this device um, with a second covered piece based on our Advantage workstation and wanting to cover the, uh, the entry tears. There was two large entry tears that needed about 15 centimeters of fabric coverage. So the first two devices that did go in 
were um, fabric devices. And then ultimately the final device that will go in is a um, bare metal stent. You can see our obliquity there. The patient really needed a 66 degree angle and, and the machine can really get you those angles as, as you needed to be able to outline the arch vessels. Um, and you can see our second device going in. And then the, the final device will end up being a, um, a bare metal device. This is more of an AP projection, but as you can tell, our, our system is still spot on with regards to where we need to cover and how far down we need to cover. Most of it done preoperatively. And there's the device. Right to the green trigger wire. Perfect. Okay. Right here. We usually so extend the device. The metal stand so all the way to the yeah. infravenous right order. Or? Uh, I I have on occasion, Gustavo. Um, I I have also seen the aorta kind of do the right thing. It will remodel, um, especially if you have a subacute aorta, as in, as in this case. Um, and uh, so I don't, I haven't felt that I always needed it. I know that there's a, there's a lot of people that do extend and, and certainly the IFU for the device does call, call for that. Um, I don't know if your, the audience appreciated, but the intravascular ultrasound showed that there was almost a coarctation in the aorta as it took the turn. Um, and while it's not ideal to um, balloon dissections. Uh, I felt that leaving, even, even though the aorta was much more dynamic, as you can see, um, I felt that leaving the, um, that portion of the aorta was, was not going to be beneficial to the patient. And you'll see, we'll end up doing a, a little ballooning. Um, and, and this is just us outlining where the celiac artery is so that we can bring that final bare metal um, piece all the way down to the celiac vessel. Which type of balloon would you use to uh, open the uh, bare metal stent? There's, there's multiple different balloons. We, here we're using a Cook Medical system, so we use the CODA, a, a 32 CODA, the smaller of the two CODA balloons. Compliant balloon. Absolutely, absolutely. The smaller the two CODA balloons and um, uh, that's we're, we're actually measuring down to to the celiac. Um, one of the things that I, I have found is that initially and traditionally we work from the patient's left side with the gantry. Um, with the ALEA system, I've learned that you can actually bring the gantry to the head of the table and be able to scan the patient from the chest and all the way down to their access sites in the groin. To, to make sure that, you know, if you're doing femoral shots and things like that, or watching your device um, navigate the aorta, that you can do that. So even, even this video it shows us working from the left, but we've learned that um, since then that these devices are oftentimes uh, deploying them from the head and having the gantry at the head allows you to even get more lateral if you need to, and you don't always have to bump the patient especially if you have a patient who's morbidly obese and you're worried that you may not get the angles that you need. And, and here's a, you can see us um, doing the ballooning. That's my partner, Dr. Doucette. Um, and, uh, you know, our, our stent initially is in perfect position, but again, we, we were somewhat concerned about the coarctation that was happening. Which was at the distal arch. Um, yes, yeah. absolutely. It was at the distal arch, and it, and it had to do with the patient's anatomy and, and their own, um, their own um, dissect, uh, true lumen being, being narrowed. But again, even though we ballooned and the device fell behind, we didn't lose our registration. Our subclavian is still marked, and, and we had, um, had memory on the table, meaning we had marked the patient's position. It did require placing an, a uh, proximal extension, and you'll see the proximal extension going in here. And there's our rep. He really wants to mark that screen, <laughs> but he doesn't really need to, because here comes the device, and you'll see it's, the registration is still where it was, and, and as I mentioned, it did require a proximal extension. And once again, at the subclavian. And, and uh, 
uh, the deployment of, of this particular device does require a little forward tension, and so we always watch it when we deploy it. But as you can see, the, the coarctation went away once we balloon fractured the dissection plane. And again, we have our anesthesia colleagues that always perform transesophageal echoes for us to make sure that there isn't any um, damage or injury to the ascending aorta following this. This is our um, final spin, and we've incorporated this into our workflow. The initial spin picks up the raw images. The second spin will um, take the, the contrast and put it on the masked images that you've seen. And there it is. So this is the injection sequence. No one's in the room, completely safe. And here's us looking at our CAT scan from the bedside and making sure, we still did we c accomplish what we wanted to? Are we seeing everything we needed to see? And based on our angiogram, I, I think we did accomplish what we needed to do. There's a little bit of flow, as you can appreciate, in the false lumen, and you may not appreciate it on the angiogram, but we certainly did appreciate it on the CAT scan. And, and it's good to know that prior to leaving the operating room, and just in case there is anything extra that needs to be done, you don't have to wait two days later to repeat the patient's CAT scan and then bring them back to the operating room to either place a proximal extension or place a distal extension or, or make any measurements. And like all good vascular surgeons, we want to make sure that the distal pulses are intact. And that's, that's just part of our process when, when we do these percutaneous procedures. And then fi you'll, you'll see us finally doing some post-processing um, after this on, on the Advantage workstation here again. And you can appreciate it on the right side. There's still a little flow in that false channel, but patient's fully heparinized, and, and I suspect that that won't be an issue once he gets his scan done. And also you have a bare metal stent, uh, so you might have communication tears uh, still perfusing from below. Uh, so sure. I think it's <laughs> really sure. something to expect. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for You're an welcome. Ex thank excellent you. presentation. Um, perhaps I can just begin with a question. It's kind of sure. uh, one that intrigues me a little. Is when you're setting up your acquisition protocols and you've got your cone beam CT um, scheme, and you said before you create a mask, then you create contrast images afterwards. Sure. How have you set up your contrast protocol to allow you to be able to um, look at the flows accurately? Because I always worry that you can sort of mistime it. So you mm -hmm. know, yeah, you might see a lot of flow in the false lumen or not any at all, depending yeah. on when you acquire the data. How, how you, you bring up a very good question, it's, it's and I, I'm challenged with this, whether we're doing peripheral angiography or if we're doing cerebral angiography. And um, truth be told, I, I watch the patient's vital signs. I look at their heart rate. We do a little test injection to kind of gauge the patient's cardiac output. If you have a young patient with a very dynamic aorta, let's say you're doing a, a transaction, it, it would be different and the timing and the injection rates would be faster versus if you have a, an octogenarian who has some heart failure and, and that contrast likes to sit in the ascending yeah. before it makes a move. So, so you tailor it to each patient. That's yeah. I mean, we have a lot of questions from yeah. the, the audience, so <laughs> we, uh, we might go for a short question, sure. short answer. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, the first question uh, is, how long does it take to perform the preparation for the image fusion? Um, it takes me about half an hour beforehand, um, and I suspect with time it'll be even less, because the Ad Advantage workstation has protocol, so it has a TVAR protocol that it's really easy to click through and step through. So. Now, half an hour, probably 15 to 20 minutes once I'm better at it. And it's very interesting in our experience that after a week, our residents and fellow, they know how to use it. And as you said, uh, with time, the, this uh, half an hour becomes uh, five to 10 minutes yes. uh, because it's, it becomes routine. And if, and if the audience is worried that you can, can you do this in a pinch, in an, or absolutely can be yeah. done while the patient's being moved on to the table and anesthesia is doing their thing. I mean, the other comment is that you can use the AW as your primary sizing, you know, software, so to speak, and you can size it weeks to months in advance. I'm save glad it, you brought that up, Gustavo. And then bring it, bring it to the case. Yes, that's exactly what we do. I've gone to using the Advantage workstation as my primary way of doing our measurements. 
Well, that's good. the other question. Yeah, well, one last question. <laughs> sure. The question says, when are you comfortable using the Fusion Overlay and the IVUS for the proximal target instead of using a secondary access for angiogram confirmation? Well, we did, we've done four cases now with IVUS and the Fusion. I think maybe now I would be comfortable doing it. Um, okay. and, uh, I, and I think, you know, it, it all depends on the anatomy. Um, one thing that's challenging is dissections have multiple fenestrations and you want to make sure you're not in and out of a yeah, fenestration. Right. Um, so will I ever stop using IVIS? Probably not, but I think that this is a very useful tool to be able to quickly get a wire up in case of an emergency where you need to really control something. Fabulous. Cool. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. We've learned a lot from uh, that uh, first case. Uh, now we're going to switch from uh, the arch uh, to uh, the lower limbs. Uh, we have, uh, Stuart will show us a, a quite a challenging uh, bilateral total occlusion lower limb that uh, he tackled uh, with his uh, new alias system. Thanks very much, Stefan. Um, so this is an 82-year-old chap who presented, as many of our patients do, as an emergency with bilateral critical limb ischemia. Patients in my part of the world tend to leave things very late. So he came in with bilateral tissue loss, and as you can see on the CT angiogram here, he had long SFA occlusions. Um, he was 82 and he was a bit frail and he was not very keen on open surgery, so we were keen on an endovascular solution, so we imported his CT angios into our AW system. Um, and what you can see here is us marking out the line of the, the superficial femoral arteries in the pre-op planning stages here. So we were doing all this in, the, um, in our control room in the sort of the 20, 25 minutes before the procedure. And you can just see us here just marking down the line of the SFA. You don't have to mark the entire line, but we're <coughs> going to be able to use these images now with the fusion system to overlay them during the procedure. So we've marked out our target arterial pathway and we're going to use it to sort of assist us through the procedure. Um, our operating room in Galway is an awful lot smaller than the operating rooms from the United States, I'm afraid. Um, so I'm very jealous looking at all their space. But from our point of view, you know, the, the ALIA system sort of sits beautifully off to one side when it's not in use. And that was very important for us because this theatre is actually unfortunately used by some other specialties that are not vascular from time to time. So it has to be a fully functional open theatre as well. But as, as you can see here, I mean, it, it swings in very quickly and we can go into endovascular mode in the course of sort of 30 seconds. So there's no real time delay here at all. So with this chap we elected, because we were going to be tackling potentially both legs, we, we elected to go for open access in his left groin. So as soon as we had the left groin open, um, we, we swung our C-arm in and then we did our, our registration process, just as you saw in the previous case. We registered the various bony landmarks, which is what we're, what we're going through here. We have two screens in the theatre. You can see our theatre is a lot more crowded, unfortunately, but um, it is sort of set up. So we have one screen for the surgical team and our radiographer colleagues are delighted because they now have a, a nice big second screen to watch everything on as opposed to trying to watch on a small screen and a C-arm. And they're able to control everything from within the theatre using the mobile console. So they're just finishing the registration here. We're just angling through. Um, and this, you know, this took all of, I would say, about a minute um, intraoperatively to get the registration. It, it was very quick. Um, obviously, the, the lower limb arteries and the targets are, are not as mobile as the thoracic aorta in the previous case, so um, the registration, I suspect, was, was slightly easier. And you can see now our target arterial pathway from the pre-op CT is being overlaid on that to give us something to help us along and be confident that our wire is going where we want it to go during these two uh, these two subintimal angioplasties. Um, we did shoot an initial angiogram. I mean, we're, we're already talking and we're very early in our experience with the, with the alia, but we're already talking about maybe being able to tackle these with, with no preoperative angiogram. I'm fairly old fashioned and reactionary and I sort of wanted to do one to make sure that we had the registration um, and we were sort of spot on with that, we felt. So a um, tiny bit of adjustment maybe before we embarked on trying to get a wire down this occlusion. Um, 
this guy helped me slightly <laughs> and that he spent a long time living in the United States. And so the water, I think, in the United States is not the hard calcified water we have in the west of Ireland because most of our patients don't have arteries, they have sticks of chalk. This chap, on the other hand, was, was reasonably um, cooperative. So you can see there's a little bit of chalk in various places there and those angios just as we're relooping our wire. And, heading down the leg, but uh, compared to a lot of the uh, the arteries we'd be dealing with, this wasn't too bad, so it sort of felt like subintimal angioplasties were probably a reasonable option for him. Um, we would on occasion actually, you, know, you, you wouldn't need the, the loops for the target arterial pathway, you'd be able to see the entire artery outlined in calcium, not, not unusually with us. So, I mean, this sort of proceeded along as a as fairly standard subintimal angioplasty, which we've sort of accelerated through here fairly quickly. Um, you can see the wire is sort of heading down. It's staying nicely within the loops. Um, and this, you know, certainly sort of saved a lot of stopping and starting and are we in, are we still following the pathway? Um, it, and, and just even having something physically to aim for another two or three centimetres down, we felt was just very, very helpful. It took a lot of the pain out of this. Um, sort of divided it all into little bite-sized segments. Um, got down to the above knee popliteal there and then started the usual game of are we back in, are we not back in, are we back in, are we not back in, will we ever get back in? Um, so we're just sort of playing around with the wire there. Um, We'll come to another run in a second where we did sort of shoot just a small little angiogram with about two mils of contrast just to see, um, at which point we discovered that no, we're not back in. Um, so then our radiographer colleagues uh, shot a roadmap for us on that very, very quickly. And, and again, the road mapping on this is, is extremely fast. So, you know, there you go. It was one touch of a button. We were road mapped um, and we had another go at the wire. And uh, as always with these things, lo and behold, the wire just went down then for no clear reason or no clear technical thing that I did, to be honest, by having another go of playing hoopla. But the wire went down, so we continued on down the leg. Um, obviously, this guy had tissue loss and rest pain. Now, his tissue loss was fairly minor. It was some sort of superficial ulcers on the toes of both feet. Um, he had an awful lot of pain. He was quite a grumpy 82 year old um, so he was very keen that everything be dealt with in, in one go um, so we sort of felt right obviously with tissue loss we're going to get inline flow so once we'd established we were back in below the knee I think we did yeah we, we shot an angiogram to confirm we're back in and just start having a look at the runoff um, so the next few series now are just going to be balloons going up and balloons going down See, we're just using long standard angioplasty balloons. I mean, there's nothing fancy particularly about this this aspect of the case. Again, our radiographers, you know, have got great control on the system and on the positioning. Um, like we heard of the previous case, be, being able to record the position of the alia system versus the patient's leg certainly helps avoid all sorts of repeat runs that we'd normally be plagued with previously when we were doing lower limb work. You're just able to say, go back into the position and you don't need to repeat the run. You can be confident that you're, you're, you're you know, matched well. Um, so on we go, more ballooning, more ballooning. It's like every sub into angioplasty all of us ever done is ballooning and it all looks a bit ragged and we did various more bits of ballooning. Um, and then we had a little look at what we had at that point and if memory serves now, yeah, I think we're just um, having a little bit of a debate in theatre and sort of going, that sort of AT looks like it might need a little bit of work proximally. So if, if memory serves, we put a wire down the AT at one point here and we did some distal angioplasty, which we're not going to bore you all with, but we, we were happy enough we didn't line flow all the way down the leg. Now, of course, what you can't hear me saying is my comment at this point in the video was, right, that was the easy leg done. Um, and this chap was very, very adamant that we try and do both legs in the one go, which I wouldn't have attempted on a C arm previously, I have to say. I would not try that on a C arm, but with the new system, we thought, okay, well, we'll try. So he had a very short stump, or certainly a shorter stump on his right SFA than I was comfortable with trying an anti-grade sheath or anything on, so we planned preoperatively to go up and over. Um, I think I'm I'm scooting ahead a little bit here. We're, we're looking at various runs still on the left-hand side there, but um, now we're just repositioning the sheath to go up and over. And so again, we'd use the fusion system here to just mark the aortic bifurcation on the pre-op CTs, which we're now going to marry up um, to our intraoperative imaging just to facilitate the up and over aspect of this. Um, and again, the, the matching here maybe isn't, it's not 
it's not perfect, but it's enough. Um, and it certainly allowed us to sort of get up and over with the rim catheter without a lot of the usual heartache you can encounter in these. And, um, so up and over we go, uh, wire goes down the iliacs and we shoot an angio at some point now in a second. Um, Yeah, there we go. Um, so, I mean, the challenge now just on this other side was just going to be getting into that sort of short SFA stump. It was about, I think, two centimetres long. So, I mean, it should be perfectly technically feasible, but it was just going to be a little bit of a challenge. And we were now doing this with some long wires and things. So, again, you know, we, we had our fusion system all sort of set up to, to marry the two, the CT angio and our on-table images together to just sort of mark the target of the superficial femoral artery there. Um, and so this is our radiographer is just bringing it up on the screen and we've got our target arterial pathway heading down the, heading down the leg again. Um, and with you know, some fairly minimal manipulation, we were happy then that we, we got into the superficial femoral artery. Um, again, this guy's renal function wasn't great, so we were just awfully keen to really minimize the contrast dose. And we've certainly found with this that our our contrast dose was greatly diminished. You know, we were used to having to give sort of 10, 20 mil boluses of contrast with our C arm. Here we're finding that, you know, routinely five is absolutely fine and you get really good quality images. So we're using, you know, fewer runs and each run is being achieved with half the contrast we were using before. Um, you can see as well, just again on this shot, you know, while we're maneuvering wires down, um, you know, the, the floor mounted system is a great advantage for us in Galway. You can just appreciate there the ceiling space is, is fairly crowded. Um, if we tried to put a ceiling mounted system in here, you know, between the lights and the anaesthetic pendants and the other bits and pieces that our allied specialties were insistent all had to remain, um, we were really, really going to struggle, you know. So the, the floor mounting of the GE system has been a real sort of godsend from, from that regard. Um, so we've tipped away along here, I think. Um, we're back to playing the game of is the wire in or out of the, the subintimal plane. I can't actually remember at this stage. We've accelerated all of this along a bit. It's Megan, my research registrar, is there beside me. You can tell from her demeanor at this stage that she's got tired of watching wires go up and down and in and out. She, you can almost hear her sighing on the video, I think, actually. Um, so, but there you go. Uh, there bid for freedom at that point um, and we sort of got down that leg um, and so again we we did various bits of, of angioplasting and we, we sort of got decent runoff down that leg as well. This leg, his right leg actually wasn't quite as bad, I mean he was grumpy but um, you know the right leg there was a bit less tissue loss and his pain didn't seem quite so bad so I mean that's basically the end of the case now at this point but we you know, we, we got him out of hospital sort of about four days after this, which would be quick for our part of the world because patients like being in hospital. They, they don't like going home. They, they like having the nurses looking after them and me seeing them twice a day. So, um, And we saw him back in outpatients last week and he's doing absolutely fine now. He's um, you know happy. His breast pain has settled down. His ulcers have healed up and he actually has a pulse in his left foot. So we're happy about that. So, so that's us. Thank you very much, Stuart. That was a, a really interesting and uh, congratulations for tackling uh, such a complex case. And interesting to see that uh, uh, before you would have a uh, stick to, to one leg and you actually managed to do both legs with less uh, contrast. Um, uh, from both sides of the authentic, there's a question regarding the size of, of your room. But yeah. first, uh, I'm going to ask you another question because uh, we've uh, uh, learned from Omid and, and, and Gustavo that uh, um, fusion is kind of routine for Arctic cases now. Uh, what we see less is what you've just shown is uh, how fusion can be helpful uh, to tackle those complex uh, lower limb cases. And it seems that um, if you start using it um, on a regular basis, it can become routine and it can actually uh, help you uh, to have a, a more technical success and be uh, maybe faster in performing those cases? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, both myself and a couple of my colleagues have started using it on all our lower memory vascularizations now. And I think one of my colleagues has, has very correctly labeled it as a game changer for us. You know, it, it's really, really accelerated the, um, the rapidity. You know, we're, we're just able to do these cases faster because we're just much happier with you know, the, the, we have the, the TAP marked out and we're just able to follow the line of the wire. Um, it, it's really revolutionized the way we approach these, yeah. It's been a big deal for us. And, and you said before you're using a sort of simple C-arm system, how long has it taken you to become able to use the, 
the Alia system with you know fusion and integration of different workflows. I mean, we're, we're only I think scraping at the surface still as to as to the whole potential of the Alia system, um, but certainly we found getting up and running with it initially very painless. To be honest, I mean, you know, we, we had great support from GE and we had great on-site support. Um, I, sort of with the discussion earlier on about how long it takes to learn these things, I, I would agree with Stefan's comment that the trainees pick it up very, very quickly, and the, the more senior surgeons, those of us who are a bit older, it takes just slightly longer. Um, but you know, the, the entire process has been very painless, and it's all been very quick. Yeah. yeah. Stuart, um, you didn't answer my question regarding the size of your room. The size. What was the question about the size the, of the room? The, the surface, um, because you, you were complaining about how small your room was compared That's to. That's just because I'm jealous of my uh, American exactly. colleagues who but, but are, who are operating in cathedrals. But do you know yeah. what is the real size of a square meter of your room or of foot? Do you know? I actually don't know the square footage of my yeah. room. I should have checked that before I, I came. Our, I shouldn't our room is about 900 it. square feet. Okay. And uh, and we feel comfortable in there with uh, the equipment and the ancillary intravascular ultrasound. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're comfortable with it. Um, I, we're, I'd say we're probably, just looking at the pictures, I'd say we're probably about 600 square feet. Mm -hmm. um, but like, we don't have any sort of space limitations around using the system. We've plenty of space for that. It's more just that we've had to sort of keep various aspects for the open surgery. Um, hey, Stuart, I noticed you brought the, the imaging from the right side of the patient, which is a great point because yeah. you can adapt that to which, si which leg you're, you're using. Can yeah, you comment well, on that? We turn the patient um, depending. So like we, we reposition the table and we reposition the entire system depending on whether this is an aortic case. So if that had been an aortic case, the, the patient would have had their head facing the opposite way in theatre and we'd have taken the alley in potentially from the other side as well. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we, we, we just put the room into a different mode depending on, on what type of case we're doing. Um, I liked your point earlier on, we, we have also been putting the C arm up at the head of the bed for a lot of these cases as well. You know the thoracic ones. It's been helping with that. You know, um, you just you're able to get in from different angles compared to a, a standard C arm with this system. <coughs> Have you tried a retrograde access? Uh, not with this yet. Mm. Yeah, I just haven't had a case where I've had to do it with this yet. Because yeah, I wonder if the advantage workstation and and the fusion would help even in if. For example, if you couldn't get antegrade, you could quickly yeah, no, yeah. switch to retrograde by taking those yeah. images, putting it on the patient, and then yeah, absolutely. work yeah. work retrograde. Absolutely. I know that's a good idea. I'm going to add it to my book of good ideas that other people have given <laughs> Things me. Things to try with the new system included. <laughs> absolutely, yes. And uh, regarding that new system, Stuart, there's a couple of questions regarding dose. Uh, did you compare a dose exposure with this new system compared to the old one? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the dose exposure for that case was about a quarter of what we would have expected from doing those cases previously. And, you know, our radiation safety officer is, is delighted with all of this. <laughs> They're just gone. Yeah, so this is fantastic. Decrease. Huge yeah. decrease. Huge decrease, yeah. 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 Uh, there's another question here about room setup. Um, what type of table do you use at your institution with your it's new urgency? It's a table. Yeah, and how do you find table. that? Yeah, it's really, really good. We really like it. Um, we like having, you have some control on it and we're able to sort of help with the positioning of the patient vis-a-vis -vis the C-arm, which we didn't have previously. We were very dependent on verbal commands and, you know, can you, would you, and, you know, another centimetre, and centimetre less, all that yeah. type of stuff. We, we've eliminated all of that with the yeah. Mackay table and with the Alia system. Yeah. The combination of the two just works That's beautifully. Change, yeah. yeah. Did you try to use a CO2 with this machine? Do you have any experience with it? I have no experience at all of that. We, we don't. So maybe, maybe I can yeah. tackle this one because we, we have a CO2 injector and I have the, the same system and uh, it really is um, uh, not an issue to use it uh, uh, routinely. Actually, this morning I did one case with CO2 because the patient was uh, uh, near dialysis. So uh, ever you need it, uh, it's actually uh, uh, user-friendly to, to adapt it to, into the system. What the only change is that we don't have the injector directly connected to the system. It, it's it's a, a separate injection. And there's one last question for you on here that says, have you had the opportunity to use the new system for any venous interventions, for example, ileate vein recanalizations? 
I, I, I had a feeling I might get asked about Aldi I fear canalizations working in the same institute as Professor O'Sullivan. Um, we we haven't. Him. That wasn't him. <laughs> are, are we sure? Yeah, we, we haven't let him into it yet. <laughs> we haven't. Okay. So we've done no Venus work yet. Okay. But I mean, we're only up and running six weeks with this. So, yeah. Okay. You know, it's, it's That's a really early days. experience. Yeah. Fabulous. Okay, well, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. I'd now like to invite Gustavo to do the third presentation for us, which is a four-vessel branched thoracoabdominal repair. Thank you very much. And we have Mark Farber joining us um, as well by video link. And Mark, I think you're going to comment at, um, at towards the end of the presentation. Yes, yes. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi, Mark. Well, thank you for... Thank you for having us today. Uh, I'm going to present this case of a 45-year-old female with Lewis Ditt syndrome. And as you can see, multiple previous aortic repairs. First, I'm very thankful to Guilherme Baumgart. Guilherme is an outstanding postgraduate research fellow with us that really he did all the hard work to prepare the video. These are my disclosures. This is a patient with a rapidly expanding intercostal patch aneurysm. She has had multiple previous aortic surgeries, as you can see, extending all the way from the aortic valve to the iliac arteries. She has a normal renal function and, and a good cardiovascular evaluation. This is her CT and geography. You can see the 3D reconstructions. So in show some of the outline of these saccular aneurysms. Note that uh, she had two left-sided renal arteries, which were reimplanted as a corral patch. And this corral patch became essentially like a sausage-like uh, uh, saccular aneurysm. And then she had subsequent to that an infrarenal EVAR with a gore excluder device. So I actually interrogated the renal artery to see how difficult it would be to catheterize from below. Uh, I felt it was going to be very difficult to do it from above with branches. So initially, I requested Cook to make two upgoing branches. The maximum working length I had to the bottom of this was 50 millimeters. Unfortunately, Cook could not make this with less than 58 millimeters. So we revised the plan and I asked for two fenestrations with preloaded catheters. And the idea here was going to be to gain access to the mouth of that aneurysm with the preloaded uh, catheters stand, and then uh, downsize this to a smaller system and uh, complete the left renal and then going a uh, total transfemoral, each one of the sequential uh, branches. We did this in the GE alley room, and this is a little bit of the positioning. I like for these cases to use uh, overhead arm position. You appreciate here how nice it is when you go on lateral views. Currently, we don't use a CSF drain. We, uh, we do use neuromonitoring. On this case, she had a fairly sizable femoral artery. It was almost two centimeters uh, throughout, including, uh, I mean, 18 millimeters or so. So actually, I did a cut down. There was a lot of scar, and I did a temporary right femoral conduit. And on the left side, we use a steerable sheath. I will show you now a video of the case. Just keep the uh, questions coming while we're loading the video, please. So first, uh, we spent some time in the AW creating uh, our map for the fusion. Um, which you can see here with uh, rings placed. Note that those uh, uh, renal arches on the left, they are quite anterior. I kept the original motion for you to appreciate the, the speed of how the image, uh, the system moves. And, and this is the, the actual speed. Uh, and I think that this is a feature actually that, that I like it because having worked in, in numerous other systems, uh, this is certainly uh, relatively fast. Just to show here that you can move the gantry and you can move the table all from the gantry control. And of course, you can also do that from the table side control as well. A nice feature of this uh, 
imaging now is the digital pad, which you've seen illustrated in the previous cases, and uh, that is certainly very convenient for the operator to work um, uh, with much less hassle than, than what we had before. What we are doing here is the by-view registration to prepare our fusion. Again, all the speed of how it moves is the original one. We have not changed that in the editing uh, of the video. This is, uh, I think, that is a, a common question, is, is how much time you lose that. And I, I have to tell you that uh, it's relatively fast. I would say once you gain experience, this becomes uh, under a minute process. Uh, the team is all trained. Uh, the trainees, as uh, the previous speakers mentioned, they, they, uh, they become really, really rapidly engaged. We did uh, pre-catheterize uh, that uh, mouth of the pseudoaneurysm to calibrate the fusion. And the other feature I'm showing here is that we are really moving the table without stepping on fluoro, adjusting the parallax and leveraging that fusion uh, to find the optimal projection, which, by the way, you can record the optimal projection on the AW planning and uh, default the system to go immediately to that, if you prefer. The device is now being advanced uh, over a Lunderquist wire. Um, you can bring the, the markers in and out throughout the case, depending uh, what's your area of interest. In. And you saw without it, then the mini aortic layout, and now the, the, the markers and, and everything. Uh, the other point I want to highlight is that a lot of this case was done in lateral view, and what you're seeing here is not magnification, but is digital zoom, which now I'm setting up the digital zoom there. You can see that uh, it looks a lot magnified, although we are working on a 50, 50 field of view, and then collimating on the digital zoom before we actually step on the <coughs> gas pedal. Uh, you can see how nice it is uh, on lateral view uh, without the arms uh, to, to really optimize the, the visualization. The device is deployed and on, on this uh, segment of the video, basically we are using the preload system just to gain access to the mouth of that uh, pseudoaneurysm. I was really concerned because the excluder device was actually covering half of the mouth of that pseudoaneurysm and there was not a lot of room on the fenestrations there and in fact you see when I deploy the uh, the, the stents here which is going to be soon uh, we actually rotate the II to 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 see uh, uh, the if both stents fully expanded So the idea here was really to create a situation where we could easily gain access to the pseudoaneurysm. Unfortunately, with this preload system, we are limited on, on the diameter and length of the stents we can use. And as you can see, we needed quite long stents on this case. So uh, these are six French shift systems, and those stents would require seven French or even eight French system, system. So we basically got access. You are seeing I'm doing a a short little spin here. And at this point, we are removing the delivery system, which is a, a 20 French delivery system, completely out. And uh, we are going to be downsizing that to an 8 French Oscar uh, tour guide and a 7 French uh, to regain access again into those uh, renal stands. Again, leveraging a lot the digital zoom. I think that that's a, a feature that uh, clearly is one of the advantages of this specific imaging unit and uh, uh, helps you to greatly minimize uh, radiation. This is probably the eighth uh, French Oscar that we are advancing insi inside that, uh, that uh, sacular aneurysm. You can see here that also uh, with lateral view, you can use your shields. Uh, 
We do have skirts uh, on the room as well, although the skirts, uh, oftentimes we pull them out when we go lateral. Uh, but all this, this protection is very critical to minimize radiation exposure. Here we are advancing a rose and wire, and uh, this actually went all the way into the vessel, and now the, the seven French tour guide. And uh, we provided a lot of detail on this video, but uh, basically uh, we're, we're seeing here now VBX stent grafts being advanced into the renal artery. And uh, we are going to do that for both renal arches. They are side by side. Those are very nicely flexible stents. And you can see now the, the other renal artery catheterized uh, with a glide wire. And this is now exchanged to uh, a Rosen wire. The other feature we often do, and it doesn't demonstrate here, is that you can put dots in the bifurcation of these vessels when you're planning. And that helps you to understand the length to the bifurcation. Uh, it's not something you are seeing on this video, but we actually frequently add that into the planing. And it's very handy on the celiac axis, on the renal arteries, uh, and so forth. We are now doing uh, ballooning with a 10 millimeter balloon. You can see uh, no compression of any of the stents. And then we're going to be doing an angiography. The other feature we often do is actually uh, uh, digital loops, uh, fluoro loops. Uh, here you're seeing a DSA, and one of the reasons I did that is because I was worried about dissection. This is the setup for our steerable sheet, so it's an 8.555 with a 0.14 wire. We then load the 6 French shuttle 90 inside to serve as a dilator that goes inside a 12 French dry seal that is 33. We then advance this into the thoracoabdominal device and form the 8.5, and then using the coaxial 6 French <coughs> with a catheter, we're going to sequentially catheterize each one of the vessels. So note now that we actually downsize the system to a 12 uh, French sheath, and uh, we are now forming the 8.5. I like to start actually from the lowest branch, and uh, I started off doing first the upper branch, but that way you move the, the sheath upwards and you don't have conflict with the previous branches. So note here that after I do an angel, again, if you have a dot, you don't have to worry about the bifurcation, and now you're seeing the stent go bareback, and that 0.14 wire really holds the 8 French sheath in place. And, and I'm sure, you know, Stefan can comment on how he does it with the 16 French. But this total transfemoral axis really, I think, revolutionized the way we do toracos. And, and it's, it's really the way to go for the majority of patients. I mean, you simplify it. You don't have to deal with arm axis. And note how often we use lateral views on this case. And this case, the overall dose at the end was under one gray with all the spins and everything. And, and most of the branches here, except for that right renal artery, were performed in a lateral view. Uh, and you can see the quality of the imaging not having the arms out. That is pretty outstanding, realizing this is not magnification. This is digital zoom. If you do magnification, you're going to get better quality. But you know, we feel this is really good quality enough. And what matters on these cases is really to reduce the dose. So uh, noting here uh, the, the angiography, again, on this case, I didn't do a lot of digital loops because I was worried about dissection of these, these vessels. Note how many little aneurysms. Now on the celiac axis, you see uh, when we do the completion angel that the patient has multiple little aneurysms within the hepatic artery. And uh, that's kind of scary because I already had a patient with Lewis Dietz that uh, about a week after the surgery decided to have bleeding in one of those, those little aneurysms. So um, this was a bit difficult, this branch. You note there's some redundance in the, the stent. 
and I advanced beyond and then pull it back to straighten. <coughs> and then uh, the other point with the connective tissue disorders is to really make sure you anchor your bridging stance deep in the target because they, they can get uh, dilated. Fortunately here is Dacron graft, all except those renal arteries was Dacron graft, so, so we are fairly safe there. And that's actually Mark Farber with me there. And uh, we're, we're just looking at the angel. Uh, I did balloon this primarily because it's inside a Dacron graft. And uh, now we are setting up the Combean. And again, this is real speed, real life. We are not uh, making the video faster or what. And uh, we do currently uh, two spins, uh, and that's also something we can discuss. We create the, the high definition mask, and then we do the second one with contrast, which create a rotational DSA, and that is a, a five second injection with two second delay at 15 ml per second, and that is diluted at 50%. So it's about 35 ml of contrast. The other nice feature about the unit is this uh, mouse with pad which allows you to edit and post-process everything from the table side and also you have the ability to do it of course from the AW uh, but uh, looking at how much we went forward in terms of assessment of the technique and quality control to really try to leave the operating room without any technical problem. And if I, my, if I may have the slides back, I just would like to share with you the CT and geography of this case. Uh, you know, this patient actually didn't have any intercoastal patent anymore. They were all occluded. So she, um, if I can have the previous slide, please. Previous slide. Previous slide, please. Well, this is the post op CT you, you're going to show us. And um, uh, it's the, the slide just before. If you can run the, uh, the CT scan on the slide number 14, that would be great. Gustavo, did, you did most of that stuff under digital Zoom? Yes, can I, can I have the previous slide, please, and can you run this video? Okay. So, yes, uh, I, I did... Uh, it's not playing. If you can play it from there, that would be great. Maybe you can click on the screen. Okay. There it is. So, we, we use digital zoom all the time. I rarely do magnification. I would say if I'm overly concerned about something, I may magnify or it's very difficult, but I try to, and that I learned from Stefan. You know, I have to say when I started having my experience with the discovery, we, I was still not used to that philosophy, you know, coming from the previous imaging we had. And that is a nice feature, I think, is, is to get your brain a costume to use the digital zoom. So just um, thank you for that amazing case. Just I, I'm going to see if Mark is still with us and if he wants to make any comments in addition. Uh, two, two comments really and a question for Gustavo. You know, uh, Gustavo, Stefan and I were on a committee about radiation safety and coming from the ESVS. And, and I think the document is coming in the next six months about the importance of digital zoom and radiation safety. Look, the current group of people that are doing interventions today have such a higher radiation dose and digital zoom is a huge advantage in, in saving uh, radiation exposure. You as the, as the proceduralist and the patient both. So it's a really important feature that uh, you have uh, accepted and, and embraced and it makes a big difference. The other thing is arm position. You know, when we do these complex cases, Gustavo, some of the older systems, we had a hard time doing the spins at the end of the case because the arms would hit the, the uh, image uh, uh, panel uh, detector and we couldn't do it. The Aaliyah has a, a bigger um, cutout and so it's much easier to do the spin and your arms up in the position you had them, we probably would not be able to do that with other systems. 
the the question really that I have for you, and, and Elman kind of uh, talked about it in his thing, was the side table usage. Gustavo, you moved from Mayo now to Houston, and you had to retrain a whole new team. And I can imagine the frustrations to going from a team that had everything set up and used to an old system and move to a new place with a new system. Most clinicians don't want to do that because of the apprehension about trying to learn everything. My experience is that the GE system is very used because of all the bedside easy controls, it's easy to set up, it's simple. There's not this big learning curve. Can you tell me, has it been that easy for you at UT to move and to get people to learn the new system and so forth? Because I think that's a huge advantage of this system is the ease of which you can reintegrate it into your practice. I mean, those are very good points, Mark. I, I have to tell you that a big strength of the system is the support and the ease of learning. Because uh, I, I've had the chance to work most of last year in another system. And I'll tell you, we've had this now for four or five months. And the team is already expert on all the aspects. It's really not an issue. Uh, all the resins are doing the models, the, the radiology techs, they, they're pretty, pretty easy and we have had great support in terms of uh, making sure they learn. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And um, uh, Rachel, uh, time flies and it's time for us to, to wrap up this session. Um, I really enjoy moderating the session uh, with you, uh, Rachel, and like to congratulate uh, the three speakers for outstanding videos, uh, very educational. We've learned a lot. We've learned from the two first speakers that uh, uh, the learning curve uh, when switching from another system to Alia is very short because you've been using the system for a very short time and you're already showing us uh, how uh, routinely uh, you're tackling uh, cases with a, a Combeam CT with Fusion. Uh, we've learned from Gustavo that you can actually push the envelope uh, when you have access to this technology and how you can reduce uh, radiation and reduce uh, contrast. Uh, all speakers uh, had a, a specific focus on that. I was uh, really impressed by all those cases. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, G, for organizing this webinar and uh, looking forward to the, the next one. Hey, hey, hey.